Nothing is real, but I just can't see the world coming together to reduce CO2 emissions to the levels that will actually stop it. I can't see China or India doing it, which in and of itself would doom the project. And I really can't see Western countries making the kinds of drastic changes that would be required to cut CO2 emissions. And if we did, there are still lots of CO2 up in the atmosphere right now, and it would cause global warming anyway. All of which made me want to know, are there other approaches? Are there other strategies we might pursue? In that spirit and in the wake of the Copenhagen summit, here is a fascinating conversation, a fascinating set of ideas, concrete ideas to solve the problem of global warming and energy without going down the Copenhagen Kyoto route, or in addition to going down the Copenhagen Kyoto route. Nathan Mirvold, you've been you've been looking into the issue of global warming, mm -hmm. um, and you've brought all your expertise. I mean, you're a trained physicist. You spent years as the chief technology officer at Microsoft. So you understand the science, the economics. Um, what is it that you, th you think when you look at what is going on, what was going on in Copenhagen? Here's the real problem, uh, or one of the many aspects of the problem. When you emit CO2, a good fraction of it, at least 20%, maybe uh, even a little more, will stay for thousands of years. Uh, so it's not like it goes up and then it can go away after a little bit. Uh, as we continue to emit CO2, it continues to make the problem worse. And then even if we stopped cold turkey, it'll be there for a long period of time. If you wanted a problem that was almost perfectly designed to be difficult for us to grapple with, this would be it. Because the cost is very high. Um, the solution is going to require a lot of sacrifice. But the benefit is diffuse and global and way out in the future. And that's the kind of problem humans are bad at. But, and that's why you have a fundamental problem with the idea, the whole approach of limiting carbon emissions as the solution to global well, warming. I think that you have to be an incredible optimist or you have to believe that it's not a, uh, a, a severe problem to think that that's the only solution we should investigate right now. Okay, uh, this building has fire extinguishers and a fire system, but it's probably unlikely there'll be a fire today. It's a low probability event, but it's important enough that we really have to have all of this infrastructure and alarms and, and firemen that will r race up here and so forth. Because although it's low probability, it's severe. In this case, we don't even know what the probability is of how severe it can be without there being very severe consequences. We also don't know when we're going to get around to getting serious. So it seems to me that we need to have a plan B. We need to have a way to buy ourselves some time if it starts getting serious quickly. Now, what else could you do? And the answer is a topic called geoengineering, which says, can we directly try to intervene? So to, to use an analogy, uh, we all know we're supposed to eat right and exercise a lot. And if we did that, we would, uh, a lot of heart disease, diabetes, tons of other diseases, we'd be better off. Turns out that's hard for people to do. <laughs> and as a result, you also have interventions that you would do, like heart surgery, that you might do to get a stent put in or to have a bypass operation, because if you neglect the problem long enough, that's what you have to do. Well, the, the equivalent of that surgery in this case are means to directly intervene. Now, one approach is to take the CO2 and suck it out of the atmosphere. Now, how do you do that? We return, or we turn actually to Benjamin Franklin. Um, in 1783, there's a volcano called Laki in Iceland, I've been there to visit it, uh, that erupted, causing a tremendous winter in 1784 in the Northern Hemisphere. So Benjamin Franklin gives a paper, he says it was the volcano. Well, we know today through lots of... Um, how, of did, how did he figure that out? Uh, he has a great... It is, it's a wonderful thing. I wish I had the text to read here because it's in this sort of um, quaint English of that era where he says that it blocked the many rays of the sun. Huh. And so far as we know today, Ben was right. And we know this because in 1991, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines exploded. 
Now, there's been lots of volcanoes since then, but a very large volcano that's got a tremendous amount of power will put a lot of uh, gases and particles into the very upper atmosphere, the stratosphere. Mount Pinatubo did. It caused global temperatures to drop by about one degree Fahrenheit uh, for about a year, year and a half afterwards. Now, that's interesting because that's about the amount of global warming that we have today. So if you could just have a Mount Pinatubo yep. every year. A Mount Pinatubo on demand would do it. And what is it doing? What is the chemical process? It's uh, spewing sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere. Why is that? So when you have small uh, aerosol particles, light will scatter off of them. Uh, that scattering is why it, one range of that scattering is why the sky is blue. Another range of that scattering is why milk is white, actually. So it turns out sulfur dioxide is very good at scattering light. And if you have sulfur dioxide, it's what gives the rotten egg smell in part, or that in hydrogen sulfides uh, uh, at Yellowstone or other places you, you have geysers. Enough of those particles will scatter light. If you had a system for delivering sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere, you could easily dim the earth by uh, dim the sun by one percent, and even do it in a way that wouldn't be visible. So, how do you pump sulfur dioxide well, into the upper atmosphere on demand? The first things that you'd think of, like oh, let's load it into 747s and carry it up, uh, are way too expensive. So, you need a cheap way to get a lot of stuff up there. So we set out to invent something like that. We've come up with uh, actually a couple ways to do it, but I'll tell you the simplest one, which is you run a hose to the sky. It, it sounds nuts, but you take a hose, uh, you sup suspend it on a series of balloons, helium balloons. You want to run it 25 kilometers up because that takes you up into the stratosphere. Now the 25 kilometer garden hose. Now, that's the interesting part. If you go through a calculation of how much you need, in our, uh, our best scheme, it's like a fat garden hose. The total amount of rate that you're pumping is about 30 gallons a minute. Okay? That's less than a swimming pool pump. Uh, so it's actually a very manageable sized problem once you come up with this idea that you put the stuff up there. The best place to put it is in very high latitudes. That's very far north or in the summer, southern hemisphere, very far south. So northern Canada, uh, Russia, someplace like that that's up 60, 70 degrees north. So run one of these, these garden hoses at the North Pole, basically one at the South Pole. Turn them on every, every year yep. and, and, you've, and you've solved the problem of global warming? Well, we've done a series of computer simulations that tell us exactly that. That uh, it, one of these units at 60 to 70 north with a set of assumptions about how you put the, um, the, the aerosol up there uh, would negate global warming as we have it today. And by putting it up there would particularly protect the Arctic. And once you protect the Arctic, you shut off a bunch of these potential tipping point mechanisms. Once you cool the Arctic, our simulations show that, in fact, you draw enough heat from the rest of the hemisphere that you bring the rest of the, the hemisphere into line, and you don't have any severe dislocations of the weather. And it's, it's worth pointing out, your stuff is all computer simulations, but of course so are the predictions that the IPCC model uses to predict very bad stuff happening. So if we believe those computer simulations, there's no reason to assume yours are wrong. Well, I, I think, yes, that we use the same kind of computer simulation, the same sort of software with the same sort of assumptions. Now, neither one of them is perfect, but it gives us confidence and at least as much confidence as we would have in the other directions. Now, of course, before you really deploy it, you'd want to run some more simulations and you'd want to do some small scale experiments. There's a lot of things to do to sort of responsibly build the full case. But from what we can tell, this is an idea that has incredible promise. Now, are people, are governments knocking on your doors? <laughs> so, uh, not so far. <laughs> and we will be back with Nathan Mervold, more on global warming, the future of energy, and a way to power the whole world. <laughs>